your life. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Jasmine Marwaha and I welcome you all to Global Interdisciplinary Summit. And today we have the other renowned speaker and it's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to Dr. Virinder Goyal. Talking about him, Dr. Virinder Goyal is currently professor and chair in the Department of Pedodontics and Preventive Dentistry at Guru Nanak Dev Dental College, Sunam, India. He is member of Education Committee, International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. He is board member of Pediatric Dentistry Association of Asia and president of South Asian Association of Pediatric Dentistry. He is member of Faculty of Dental Surgery at Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Glasgow. He is also a member of American Dental Association, American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, International Association of Dental Research, and many other professional bodies. He is past Journal Secretary and past President of Indian Society of Periodontics and Preventive Dentistry. So today he'll be going to talk about a very important topic for clinicians as well as students, that is management of incipient carious lesions. And I'm sure this session will be profitable and everybody will enjoy and learn something new. So before moving ahead, I would like you guys to register yourself for CE and to see other details, visit the links given below in the description box. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Jasmine. Welcome. This is uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you. Thanks a lot once again. Uh, here we go. Uh, let me share my screen first. Yes. Uh, very good evening uh, uh, from India. This is eight o'clock uh, in the evening and hope you all are safe and healthy. Uh, like India, I think most of us are locked down at home. Uh, sometimes it's good to be at home. So today, uh, not wasting much of time because uh, Rakesh has ordered me to finish within 45 minutes, but it's a big topic, so I'll try my best to complete it in 45 minutes. That is management of incipient carious lesions. Uh, basically, there are a few learning objectives of this webinar. The first is we will be able to understand what is the carious process, the latest carious process, how we detect the disease process, process at the earliest possible time and then we decide which kind of treatment which type of treatment is needed uh, uh, especially uh, the non-restorative treatment or the minimal invasive treatment or what, what we can say is the micro invasive treatment for the non-cavitated lesions for in adults as well as in the children dental caries because a lot of changes have happened, uh, like, like what we have uh, known about dental caries 100 years back when Dr. G. V. Black was there. And today, uh, when a lot of uh, research at microbiological level, at uh, uh, fluorescent uh, histological level, there are so many changes have happened in the definition of dental caries. Now the dental caries is uh, a basically a multifactorial disease, which is a biofilm mediated. That is an important thing to know that it is a biofilm mediated disease, which is driven by the sugar exposures. It depends upon uh, how frequently the sugar exposures are there. Apart from that, this disease process is not a continuous process. This disease is a, a process of different phases of calcification, decalcification and recalcification. And out of decalcification and recalcification, whatever the phase overpowers, that is the result of this dental caries. And the cavitation which we see in dental caries 
is one of the sign and symptom of the disease. It is not actually a disease. It is the symptom of the disease. Now, this caries process, this caries process, uh, has multiple factors. One factor is saliva. Another is biofilm, as we have already discussed. In this biofilm, there are a number of bacteria present. And the number of bacteria could be physiological bacteria, could be pathological bacteria. And their number, the quality and the quantity of pathological and the physiological bacteria depend upon number of factors. And the, one of the factors is the diet, the sugar exposure. Another factor is the presence of biofilm. If this biofilm is getting mechanically removed very frequently, then there are less chances that these bacteria can cause decalcification at a particular site. Then the presence of fluoride in your food, in your water. And then apart from that, there are few other factors like a person's behavior, person's knowledge about oral health measures, the patient, person's attitude, the patient's education, the socioeconomical status, the income of the person. Because it has been seen that in civilized countries, the developed countries, this disease has decreased incidence. The prevalence of this disease has decreased a lot. But the countries which are still developing, the prevalence is still more. So the countries, the people who have less economical status, uh, their income is less, their education status is less, still the caries is on a higher side. In the past, we always used to just drill and fill because that was the surgical mode of management of the caries. Because at that time, looking at the cavity was the prime treatment protocol. Like we just used to see the cavities, number of cavities, and we just uh, try to uh, clean the cavities and we just uh, try to fill the cavities. But now, when we look at the latest knowledge, latest concept about dental caries, the pathogenesis of the dental caries, pathophysiology of the dental caries, now we know that this disease process can be arrested at any stage. Rather, it can be reverted. And most importantly, it can be prevented. So we now have a thought of heal and see that we want to heal the disease lesions and we want to seal those lesions so that in future the tooth tissue which is a very very important tissue because once lost it's lost forever so the tooth tissue which is very very important very very expensive and which is going to stay for a whole life uh, for the whole lifespan we try to save as much as we can so we heal and we seal the lesion and we make sure that the lesion becomes recalcified and it is more resistant to future caries attack. That's what we think about. Now, this is one of uh, the uh, presentation, uh, the diagram, the photograph, in which we can see on the top left is the modification of the diet. Because the biofilm, which, is, which has a physiological flora, but because of availability of ferment, fermentable carbohydrates, it becomes the biofilm with pathogenic bacteria. And these pathogenic bacteria are acid-producing and acid-tolerating bacteria. So once these bacteria get localized because of biofilm, which is not getting mechanically cleaned very, very frequently because of improper oral hygiene, it leads to demineralization, decalcification of the enamel. But once the factors like oral hygiene is fine, the carbohydrates which are required for uh, the bacteria to survive, those are not available. Saliva, because in saliva, lots of minerals are there. 
fluorides from water or from the dentifrices, the calcium salts from the uh, saliva itself, from the milk products, from uh, the dentifrices, if are available, the same lesion can remineralize. But if the decalcification keeps on going on, keeps on going on, then what happens? It leads to the signs and symptoms of the disease that is cavitation. And for that, we need to give symptomatic treatment according to the cavitation, the moderate, moderate cavity, the large cavity, the extensive cavity. So depending upon that, we need to change our treatment protocol. Now, what is the goal of any caries management plan? The first is, the first and foremost goal of this caries management plan is, we want to prevent the onset of the disease for whole lifespan of person. That is very, very important. Sorry. Then at patient level, we try to do some measures so that we re-establish the mineralization balance. Because whenever there is a imbalance in remineralization, it leads to decalcification. Like whenever there is a localized drop in pH, that too very, very frequently, that leads to mineral loss from the minerals, uh, from the enamel. <clears throat> and if the same thing is reverted back, then there will be deposition of minerals into the decalcified enamel. Same way at the lesion level, at the uh, whatever the decalcified area is there, at that level, we try to do procedures which are non-surgical. That means which are non-invasive. And if at all, we need to do some invasion. It should be micro-invasive, not macro-invasive. Unless until there is a frank cavitation. But this, uh, uh, the basic goal of carriage management plan is to avoid transformation of any lesion, any uh, incipient carriage lesion into a frank cavitation. So we try to do all those measures so that the cavitation is at least prevented. Now, we talk about carriage risk assessment. Because first goal is to know about whether that person or a patient is prone to caries or not. This is very, very important to know. Because if the person is not at all prone to caries, the treatment protocol is different. If his low caries risk is there, then treatment plan is different. And accordingly, it is different for moderate and high risk patients, which we will discuss in our coming slides. But why this is important uh, to know about caries risk assessment? First is, we need to know the lesion activity, whether the lesion is active or it is, it is arrested caries. If it is active, how much progress of the caries is, whether it is in, in, into enamel, it is into the denting, and how much into the denting, that is important. Then we need to know the, what is the main etiological factor, the agent which has led to this disease. For example, it may be saliva, it may be the diet, it may be the poor oral hygiene, it may be some other factor like anxiety, frequent snacking, behavior changes. So we need to know what is the main etiological agent which has contributed to this disease. That is also important. Then when we know about the risk factors, we need to plan which is the best restorative treatment for that patient. For example, what restorative materials or what materials I should choose this for this particular patient. But that is only possible if I have a risk assessment level that how much, how, how much, severe, uh, severity of the risk to that patient is. That's important. And then if I know the risk 
assessment. I, I know how much uh, uh, prone that patient uh, to caries is. At least I can know what will be the prognosis of the disease. Although it's a very dynamic, it is not a single factor, but still I will have some idea what will be the prognosis of the disease. And then on recall visit, I can actually, uh, I mean, plan and I can uh, know what is what will be the efficacy of my caries management plan. That is important. So that is the reason the caries risk assessment of a patient is very, very important. And there, I will discuss few of uh, the plans, few of the latest guidelines by different, different uh, countries, by different, different associations, by different, different groups. For example, this one is the comprehensive assessment and personalized caries care plan. You can see uh, there are different, different headings for this. First is the history, because if you go for the history of the patient in detail, you can check the level of caries risk. That what is uh, the risk of uh, caries? Uh, it's a no risk, it's a moderate, it's a low, it's a high risk patient or highly, very high risk patient. Then you need to classify the caries uh, into uh, uh, whether it is a sound enamel or the caries has just entered into the enamel. It's an incipient decay or enamel has crossed uh, DEJ or into dentine. What is the level of uh, caries that we need to know? Because that is possible uh, with a very uh, good clinical examination. Like for examining the teeth for caries, we normally used to uh, use probes and explorers, which are not indicated now. Only dry field, clean teeth, and a good light. That is very, very important to check the teeth for caries. We can use magnification also, maximum 2.5 into magnification is good enough to see the carious lesions. Right? Apart from that, we have the radiographs, we have the diagnotants, we have QLF. So many measures are there, so many techniques are there. Uh, but good light, clean teeth, dry teeth, little bit of magnification, supported with your good quality radiograph, can give you some idea about the staging of caries. Sometimes in proximal areas, it becomes difficult to see the incipient carious lesions, the start of the lesions, because we are not sure whether the surface of the cavity is intact or it's a broken. We do not know it is a non cavitated lesion or a cavitated lesion. The studies say on a radiographic examination, if you see any radiolicency which has crossed uh, denta, dentino enamel junction, but it is in the outer half of dentine, even till that time, the surface could be intact and you can still try conservative treatment measures rather than making a cavity. Those are the studies, right? So classification is important. For that, a good examination is important. Uh, I will discuss like uh, uh, various uh, radiographic techniques, uh, like how we classify, I'll discuss. And then we have management, like how we manage those uh, patients of uh, caries. Then it could be uh, the sound tooth, or it could be the uh, teeth which are, uh, which are not cavitated, there could be the teeth which are cavitated. Here in this presentation, we'll only talk about non-cavitated lesions. We will not talk about the cavitated lesions, about the non-cavitated lesions. So when you have come to know about the risk assessment, you know the etiology, what has led to this caries, you know uh, the what kind of uh, uh, caries it is, uh, in what, uh, how much progressive the caries is, then you can plan the treatment for that patient. This is what is comprehensive assessment and personalized caries care plan. 
there is new uh, classification which has come previously we have all we all discussed about the gb black classification now we have a mi classification of uh, g mount this is one classification in which we talk about uh, the size and the site from this we can know what is the site of the lesion and what is the size of the lesion like whether it is a minimal caries or a moderate caries in large caries or extensive caries accordingly it's a pit and fissure or a contact area or a cervical one when the lesion is a size 0 or size 1 we can treat those lesions with only remineralization recalcification we do not need any operative procedure so that is the purpose of knowing what is the extent of the caries because if you know how how much the extent of the caries is you can plan still plan remineralization uh, protocols rather than going ahead with the operative or the surgical protocols now the lesion severity Uh, from the radiograph if you take a bite wing x ray from the radiograph you can classify lesion into these categories e0 means no lesion if you find radio lucency which is in the outer half of the, of the enamel e1 it is the inner, inner half of the enamel it is e2 similarly d1 d2 and d3 till d1 from e1 to d1 we can plan non surgical procedures for the recalcification of the decalcified lesion and rather we can make this lesion more stronger to the acid attack for future so from e1 to d1 we do not need to worry about doing uh, i mean uh, going ahead with the surgical procedures rather these can be treated with more conservative way with the non surgical procedures this is another uh, system that is by american academy uh, sorry american dental association according to that uh, the cavity is divided into sound initial moderate and advanced and on the other side uh you can see you can see that according to the radio lucency radio lucency they are divided into e0 a e1 e2 uh, d1 d2 d3 and and if the lesion is into d1 till d1 means the outer half of the dentine if it is involved uh, till that time the studies show that the su surface of the uh, uh, lesion is still intact and that is the reason we do not recommend use of explorers for examining for dental caries because if we use explorers we will break the soft fragile surface of the sub surface caries lesion and the lesion which we could remineralize will not be possible because if we break the surface of the lesion we will be making a cavitation and once it is cavitated it is not possible to revert back so that is the reason we should not use explorers for examining for dental caries because all incipient caries lesion which we can revert back by using a non surgical way will become cavitated because it has a very fragile and soft surface so that is the reason we do not recommend uh, using explorers the non cavitated caries lesions are those lesions which appear macroscopically intact and without any clinical evidence of cavitation they can be called as incipient they can call they can be called as initial the early or white spot lesions but it may be possible that these lesions are not always white spot white means progressive 
and if these lesions turn brownish means there are phases of recalcification because when the lesion will become recalcified then it will become brown or it will become dark in color so if the lesion is brown that doesn't mean it is a normal but that means there were phases of recalcification also during the process of decalcification because we know the dental caries is a phase of decalcification and recalcification now there is another important thing that is a occlusal plaque index visible occlusal plaque index that is also a very important index to estimate caries activity like suppose on an examination you find a lesion and then you have a doubt whether this lesion is non active or it is a active lesion so for that uh, this visible occlusion plaque index is very very important to know so zero means no plaque uh, like even if you probe uh, run your probe very gently that's important we should run a dental probe carefully on a fossa or a glue that is important not very force it should be very gentle running and if you find a thin plaque which is a, a, a slightly a slight plaque is there then we call it as one when there is a thick plaque uh, which is easily detectable plaque uh, which is identifiable with the opaque eye then we call it as two but when there is a heavy plaque total surface is covered with heavy plaque accumulation and if there is a significant amount of plaque present over the occlusal surface then we consider and 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 there is a, a lesion also present then we consider it as it could be a active lesion but sometimes what happens when the teeth are into erupting phase suppose a 6 year old child uh, with the erupting molar that molar will have Uh, visible plaque because that molar is not due to occlusion here uh, here something is very important uh, to note that this is the time when these teeth are very very prone to caries for from the time of eruption till 4 year that from the time of eruption till 4 year these teeth are very very prone to caries and if the oral hygiene practices the diet and these things are taken care the fluoride varnishes right is applied if these things are taken care the longevity of the tooth will be more so from eruption time to 4 year this time is very very critical for the tooth to develop caries and then is one more uh, like for example like uh, the occlusion surface is very very easily visible like you can actually see occlusal surface of the any of the tooth i agree that if the dentin is progress into the dentin but the opening of the pit or fissure is intact then it is not possible to see what is there in the deep uh, uh, area but the problem is with the with the pro approximal surfaces because the proximal surfaces especially in the primary teeth the primary molars are not at all visible they are hidden one thing is the contact areas the contact areas of uh, deciduous teeth are very very wide so it is not possible to see uh, clinically the proximal surfaces right so then we have another index that is called as papilla bleeding index papilla bleeding index and now if you suspect any caries lesion into the approximal area into into the contact areas and then you find a bleeding which is there it is a, the interdental papilla is inflamed the gingiva is inflamed into that area then you can be sure that the proximal caries lesion is active. so that is another guideline for you to know whether into the proximal area the lesion is active or passive 
because if the bleeding is there the gingiva is inflamed into the uh, or the interdental papilla is inflamed that means there is a lot of plaque and wherever there is a biofilm there are chances of caries in that case we cannot take chance for the wide uh, approximal areas of primary teeth especially although the flossing is recommended but in case of children the compliance is very very poor that is another problem and that is the reason there are more of proximal cavities especially in primary teeth then we have another system that is international caries detection and assessment system according to that system uh, uh, right from 0 to 6 and if the lesion is into uh, uh, this uh, zero, uh, 1 to 2 or 3 we can still manage it non surgically and then in under this system apart from caries classification it is also a management system it is not only a international caries classification it is a international caries classification and a management system in which we go ahead with patient assessment that we already we have discussed about the history taking and uh, to know the risk assessment then we check the lesions how many lesions are there then we check whether it is a active or it is a passive lesion then we make the decision uh, at the patient level and at the lesion level so we collaborate both the things the patient's finding and the lesion finding and collaborating both the things we plan uh, the treatment for the patient whether it is a surgical treatment or it is a non surgical treatment but basically the treatment should be the goal of the treatment should be the patient should be caries free for whole life span that should be the goal of the treatment and then uh, we have another uh, system to know uh, if the lesion is uh, active or if the lesion is a passive for example uh, first thing is the location of the lesion if the lesion is uh, the lesion is present into a plaque stagnant area there are three plaque stagnant area in the teeth one is the pits and fissures second is the proximal areas and third is the cervical area along the gingiva because these are the areas which are protected relatively protected from the mechanical cleaning by tongue maybe the fibrous food uh, maybe the cheek so these are the area so if a lesion is present in those areas you can always suspect lesion could be active and already we have discussed plaque if lot of plaque thick plaque sticky plaque we consider lesion is active and when you touch the surface when you gently uh, move around and the probe over it explore over it if you find the surface smooth and hard that means the lesion is inactive but on the same side if you find the enamel rough you find the enamel soft that means it is a active lesion and same is the periodontal uh, this gingival status if around the lesion there is no bleeding no uh, inflammation uh, no plaque means healthy that means the lesion could be inactive or arrested but if there is a inflammation and bleeding on growing then you always consider that the lesion could be active now knowing all these things we need to plan the treatment for example if i talk about e1 lesion or e2 lesion e1 means outer half of the enamel e2 means full enamel till dej and d1 means it has touched the dej and just crossed the dej and d2 means halfway into the dentine and d3 is the inner half of the dentine 
Now, we will not talk about uh, the D3 lesions because uh, in this webinar, we are going to talk about the non-surgical way of management, basically, or the micro-invasive way of treating the lesions. Now, in E1 or E2 lesion, now we need to know how much is the risk caries risk. And if there is the caries risk is very, very less, then we monitor the patients and we evaluate. But now we have come to know what could be the etiology even for that lesion, right? And then we try to remove that uh, etiology and we guide the patient about the diet, we guide the patient about the oral uh, hygiene, then we, whatever fluoride is recommended for that patient, we do that. Any antimicrobial therapy, if needed, we plan. But if the caries risk is high or even the moderate, then to arrest those lesions, either we go ahead with the remineralization or we go ahead with uh, resin infiltrates or we go ahead with sealants. So depending upon condition, we choose any of these. And same is for D1. For D1, since it has entered into denting, but the surface is intact, even the risk, uh, risk we cannot say the risk could be no risk or it is a low risk. Because once you find a single cavitation, single lesion which is active, the patient is obviously at a risk. Because then we have to do the treatment. Then we cannot say the patient is not at a risk. The patient is at a risk. Then, because since in D1 lesion, the cavity is still intact. The only decalcification is in the subsurface area. So the uh, surface is still intact. So we go ahead with either remineralization, uh, infiltration, or we go ahead with the proximal sealants. And then we review the patients accordingly. Then we have another way of uh, uh, planning depending upon the severity of the carious lesion. Uh, this is what we have clubbed like the IGDES system. Then we have clubbed the radiographic extension of the lesion, maybe the diagnosis and finding also, and then what could be the treatment. So for the inactive caries, if the lesion is arrested, none of the treatment is needed except for follow -up. But if the patient is having a carious lesion till D1, the diagnostic value is from 0 to 40. If this is 1 to 2, then you go ahead with either non-invasive or micro-invasive. But if it is the caries has progressed further, then you need to go ahead with the treatment. Treatment, whatever the treatment you plan, it should be with minimum invasive method. Because now we have raisins, we have uh, good uh, bonding systems. So whatever you we do, uh, we should do it with minimal invasive treat, uh, pro treatment protocols. Now, in general, whenever you find a tooth which is carious and the occlusal surface is carious, in general, if the lesion is inactive, then a simple cleaning prophylaxis and oral hygiene, the diet and the fluoride, this is what is needed. No treatment as such is needed. No professional treatment as such is needed. But if the surface is categorized as an active lesion, then it has to be treated with non-invasive method or it has to be sealed. That is the general rule for occlusal caries. For a proximal caries, for all proximal surfaces, mesial or distal, the same if the lesion is inactive, then the treatment is not needed. If the lesion is inactive, then treatment is not needed. But if the lesion is active, then the treatment is needed. Uh, for superficial lesions, and especially when there is no caries risk, 
then you don't need to go ahead with uh, even the uh, non-invasive methods. We can simply uh, advise the patient to go ahead with uh, toothbrushing, then floss, then fluoride applications. And But if the lesion is uh, more, like uh, uh, the risk is more, then the lesion has to be infiltrated. That is important. If the, if the risk is less, then infiltration is not needed. But if the risk is there, then the lesion has to be infiltrated. And now till now, we have come to know that dental caries is not a continuous process and uh, it, uh, it can be reverted at any stage. And this is also a very well known fact that whenever the pH is less than 5.5, then there is a demineralization, right? But the floor appetite, which is formed after recalcification of a decalcified lesion or enamel, the floor appetite, which is formed, that needs a pH less than 4.5 to demineralize again, which makes this floor appetite more resistant to acid. And achieving 4.5 pH in clinical setup is difficult. And that is the reason once a floor appetite is formed after recalcification, the lesion become more resistant to demineralization. So that is, this is how the critical pH for hydroxy appetite, which is a normal crystal of uh, enamel is 5.5. But for critical pH for floor appetite is 4.5. And that is the reason it, it is more uh, resistant to acid attack. So there are protective factors, there are pathological factors, and whenever, whatever the factor overpowers, the end result will be. If there are more protective factors, no caries. If more pathological factors, there will be caries. Now we need to transform these, uh, we need to add more protective factors in patients' oral cavity. That is it. There are various ways, various, various methods of remineralization of incipient caries lesion and reduction in number of cariogenic bacteria. Right from chlorhexidine, diamine chloride, acyl silver chloride, then ozone, triglosin, then we have uh, sealants, we have resin infiltrates, we have uh, hydroxyapatite, we have novamin, that's a bioactive class, we have CPP, ACP. There are so many things. The main minerals which are required for recalcification are calcium, phosphate, and chloride. These are the main components which are needed for recalcification of a hungry hydroxyapatite crystal after decalcification. Now for any remineralization process, what we need, we need sufficient minerals which should be present in saliva and whatever the action is occurring, that should occur adjacent to demineralized spot in a hydroxyapatite lattice. That is needed because if minerals are somewhere else and decalcified spot is somewhere else, it's of no use. So it has to, the mineral has to be present just adjacent to or in the vicinity of demineralized spot. That is important. And that spot should be absolutely clean and neat and clean. It should be biofilm free. If it is not free, then the minerals will not be able to enter into that demineralized spot and the recalcification will not happen. If it will happen, it will not be very, very successful. It will not be complete. Then there are fluorides, calcium phosphate based, calcium sucrose phosphates, sugar substitutes, hydroxyapatites, and few more. What are the properties of ideal remineralizing material? That is also important to know. This Remineralizing material should supply appropriate. It should not deliver excess of calcium. That is important. And it should not favor calculus formation. 
if lot of calculus is there this is not acceptable and it should work at an acidic ph because in a karyogenic biofilm the ph is always less so it should work in acidic ph it should work in absence of saliva also in a zero stomach patient it should work and it should boost the remelizing properties of saliva that is important because there were uh, many uh, studies were done about the non restorative techniques for caries uh, systematic analysis uh, this review is done that meta analysis this is one of the example according to this uh, meta analysis we can see that the sealants plus 5% sodium chloride varnish resin infiltrate plus 5% sodium chloride varnish and 5000 ppm of fluoride toothpaste were the most effective for arresting and reversing non cavitated occlusion a proximal caries lesion including the root caries in both primary and permanent there is a problem with the only fluoride vehicle the problem is once a fluoride is applied onto the surface of the lesion what happens there will be a blockage of the spores of the enamel no doubt the surface will be remelized but what about the subsurface what about the lesion body the lesion body will not get remelized because there will be a blockage of the enamel pores what will happen there will not be exchange of ions between the enamel surface and the body of the lesion so what happens the full remelization is not possible it's a difficult to achieve so there is a problem with the, if we use only uh, the fluoride vehicle for uh, these remelizing agents so there are many modifications uh, we'll just discuss how how these modifications are there now one of the uh, solution which we use is acid related uh, fluoride there are many uh, ways of uh, application of this uh, acid related uh, fluoride onto the patient because this because of the acid uh, because of the less ph the ph is reduced in this solution what happens it prevents the blockage of enamel pores that's what we want we don't want that when we apply fluoride the pores should get blocked and the body should be devoid of remelization now with this application the uh, the pores are still open and they can receive the minerals there could be ion exchange so what with what happens with that the full remelization of the lesion happens. and another thing is because of low ph the calcium and fluorides from the bacteria from the plaque matrix and the tooth surface is also released and that is also used for recalcification then we have another product which is a self assembling peptide uh, one of the product is available in switzerland in europe uh, with this spread name it has p11 4 monomer basically this diffuses this uh, peptide diffuses into the subsurface micropores of the lesion and then it it is a like a kind of a matrix which attract calcium phosphate from the saliva and once it attracts calcium and phosphate from the saliva exactly like a physiological uh, crystallization formation it happens exactly the same way the recalcification of the enamel and dentin will happen so that is how this peptide helps in recalcification of the enamel and the dentin then we have a arginine this is another uh, technique of uh, remelizing the lesions basically it produces ammonia the main uh, purpose of uh, arginine is it produces ammonia and it is a alkaline and because of that there is a high uh, ph 
the pH becomes alkaline. And because we know when there is a drop in pH, it leads to decalcification. And when there is an increase in pH, there is deposition of uh, the salts into the enamel and the dentine. And now because since this product contains calcium and fluorides, and now because of high pH, the enamel can receive calcium and uh, fluorides from this component and remelize the lesion. That, that is how this functions. And then we have tricalcium phosphate products. Actually what happens in uh, tricalcium phosphate, if the fluoride is added and without this uh, organic material, then what happens? The calcium will combine with fluoride and it will not be available for remineralization. But now what happens because of this organic material, organic material is nothing. It is a, a surfactant, uh, laurel sulfate which we use. So it is added. And because this organic material has an affinity for the tooth surface, this attaches with the tooth surface and it carries uh, the calcium ions to the tooth surface. And since uh, this doesn't allow the fluoride to be attached with calcium, so both the ions are available separately. And if both the ions are available separately, so the calcium will be deposited and the fluoride will be deposited. This is how a complete remineralization happens. Then we have a bioactive glass. Bioactive glass uh, is was basically of uh, mainly two types, one with fluoride, one was without fluoride. Previously, we used to use uh, without fluoride. But now uh, there are uh, bioactive glasses uh, which are fluoride, fluoride containing uh, bioactive glasses. In this, what happens? Uh, all minerals are within one glass because in glass particle, all minerals like calcium, phosphate, potassium, fluoride, they are added. And these are present in a single composition. And when this is applied onto the tooth surface, the fluoride which is released, that is released slowly over a period of 12 hours. And in the meantime, calcium can enter into the hydroxyapatite crystal and then the fluoride can enter. So this is how it will make uh, the lesion remelines. Then we have a hydroxyapatite uh, product. This is a ready-made product. This is what uh, enamel is made up of. So noble uh, hydroxyapatite and fluoride. These are the components which are uh, applied onto the lesion and they can directly fill up the pores which are there into an incipient carious lesion. And once they enter into uh, incipient carious lesion, they act as a template and they will attract the calcium and the phosphate from the saliva and they will promote the crystal growth. That is how they work actually. Then we have uh, theobromine. Uh, one toothpaste is available in US with the trade name of Theodent. To my knowledge, it may be uh, in some countries, maybe more are available, but to my knowledge, it is a Theodent toothpaste which is available in US. Basically, uh, this will induce the increase in crystal size. And when the crystal size will increase, it will uh, take up the salts and the minerals from the saliva. And that is the basic mechanism that it helps in increasing the crystalline size. Uh, size and uh, it improves uh, the crystal formation of in the appetite. That's how it functions. Then uh, we have a combination of calcium glycophosphate and sodium monochlorophosphate. Uh, this is also uh, available. This combination is also available, available. And basically it elevates the concentration of a plaque uh, calcium. This is how it functions. And one of the rinse and one of the toothpaste also contains sodium fluoride. So, uh, Calcium as well as fluoride is supplied by this component for recalcification of the lesion. Then we have uh, CPP, ACP, that is another product uh, which is used. Then we have xylitol chungans. Uh, uh, 
GC tooth mousse uh, is one of the uh, is one of the product in different countries by different name. It is available. It is available as uh, with fluoride and with fluoride. One is uh, plus plus is has fluoride and one is without uh, fluoride. That is um, that means means GC tooth mousse and MI and MI plus like this uh, chemicals are available. And these are the milk proteins which uh, gives amorphous amount of calcium and phosphate and if fluoride then it gives a fluoride also and uh, whenever there is a drop in ph into the plaque they get activated calcium and phosphate is released and that actually uh, remineralizes the lesion and it it has to be applied by the patient regularly about uh, minimum once in a day preferably during night and if possible twice in a day, it has to be rubbed onto clean teeth. That is important. The patient has to clean uh, her or her, his teeth first, and then it has to be applied. And now there are a few of the recommendations for arrest or reversal of non-cavitated carious lesions on the fluidal surface of primary teeth. Uh, that is, we can use sealants plus 5% sodium fluoride varnish it has to be varnish has to be applied every three to six months. Then you can apply 1.3% APF gel. It has to be applied every three to six months. And then resin infiltrate, which we will discuss after this, that can be applied plus 5% sodium fluoride varnish. And or the children can use 0.2% sodium fluoride mouth rinse once per week. But this is not recommended for very young children or the children who cannot control their swallow. Because if they will swallow, it is not at all recommended for such patients. It has to be supervised. They should not ingest it. That's important. And then we have uh, recommendations for occlusal surface of permanent teeth. A use of sealants, frame, and the uh, plus 5% sodium fluoride varnish. Uh, that is important. And then they can... Uh, uh, go ahead with 1.3% APF uh, every three to six months and then 0.2% sodium fluoride mouth rinse for adults uh, because till this time they are adults. So adults are manageable children. So using mouthwash once per week will not be a problem. And for the a proximal lesion, uh, the proximal, the mesial distal lesion, 5% uh, sodium fluoride 5% sodium fluoride varnish to be applied every three to six months. Resin infiltrate alone or resin infiltrate plus 5% varnish and or the sealants alone. These are the recommendations for the approximate lesions. And for the facial or the lingual surfaces, 1.3 or 2-3% because for the facial and lingual surface, the, uh, the easy thing is we can actually see the progress of the lesion. For the proximal lesion, it becomes a problem. For the deep cavity, uh, uh, the pesal fissure, is, it's a problem to be sure whether the caries is progressing or no. No doubt we have a clinical uh, way of examining or we have a radiographic uh, way also. But for facial and lingual surfaces, it's not a problem. We can anytime see very easily what is the progress going on. So 1.23% APF gel or 5% sodium fluoride varnish is recommended. That's what is the recommended for the facial and the lingual surfaces. Now we had icon that is one of the resin infiltrate. Uh, this is one of uh, the material which is uh, a very, very uh, low viscosity uh, resin which is infiltrated into the porous enamel and uh, this will fill up the spaces in an incipient carious lesion because it basically it gives a diffusion block because if even if the biofilm is there that cannot diffuse they, can, they cannot take out the uh, salts from the enamel there is a diffusion block at the tooth biofilm interface no doubt we need to have a protocols for frequent cleaning by motivating the patient by guiding the patient about the flossing as well as the brushing 
but otherwise because it gives a diffusion block so uh, the the kerogenic acids cannot penetrate into the uh, enamel so we can stop incipient carious lesion without drilling so there are basically three things in this pack one will be etchant which will be a hydrochloric acid not like a phosphoric acid which we use for compost then it will have a ethanol which is a drying agent uh, because after you etch it after you wash it then you have to apply ethanol over it so that it will completely dry up the pores into the enamel for receiving the infiltrate so after that a very very low viscosity very very low viscosity resin is flown onto the etched enamel and uh, then uh, once it is uh, penetrated into the pores it is cured and uh, the action which is applied that is applied for 2 minute we should always remember that the enamel uh, or the action which is applied onto the enamel that, that is applied for 2 minute then rinsing is done for 30 second then we apply uh, this uh, ethanol a drying agent for again 30 second then we apply uh, resin infiltrate for 3 minute because 3 minute application is required because it uh, it is withdrawn into the capillaries it goes into the uh, porous enamel so for 3 minute it has to be applied and then cured after that again it is applied because of shrinkage it is uh, sucked into the pores so the surface still remains without uh, this infiltrate so to top up that we again apply resin infiltrate uh, and then we cure it finally we cure it because nothing remains onto the surface like a carious, uh, chalky areas uh, etching done then uh, uh, washing done then drying agent was applied then infiltrate uh, is applied onto the surface and it is cured and then reapplication is done uh, and after that this becomes almost normal like this is how uh, lesion can be uh, repaired with this material then for the proximal surfaces Uh, the company will provide you uh, a proximal separator kind of thing and uh, because with this you you don't need uh, basically um, these separators because everything is available in the kit only you don't need anything additional because with this particular design you can infiltrate the proximal areas because this goes inside so from this only you can flow down the Uh, this resin infiltrate into the proximal so this one is particularly from the proximal surfaces so there were many uh, uh, studies were done a systematic review has been done and according to that we can actually see that uh, resin infiltrate appears to be an effective method to arrest uh, the progression of non cavity lesion then we have patent fisher sealants and uh, preventive resin restorations i'll just talk something about uh, this kind of condition like suppose you have this kind of condition and the patient is at high risk and you don't want that uh, till the time this tooth comes completely erupt and uh, it's able to isolate and uh, then it should get caries you want that we should do something right here only so because now the problem is it is not possible to isolate this tooth uh, because this tooth is still into erupting phase and we all know that uh, raising uh, application and any resin based sealant application is not at all possible because that is a technique sensitive and needs complete dry field isolated field and here it is not possible so for the time being we can apply glass enamel sealants that is only applicability uh, of glass enamel sealant because otherwise glass uh, enamel uh, sealants uh, do not have a very good wear resistance and uh, so always their role as a pit and fissure sealant is doubtful but in certain cases we can use uh, these uh, glass and number uh, sealant but follow up is very very important you have to follow up this patient and whenever you feel that there is a break you have to replenish it uh, with more hydrophobic uh, resin 
uh, sealants. That's possible. But otherwise, sealants are amazing uh, thing. Whenever we have any high risk patient, whenever you detect a high risk patient, although there is no caries, you should advise pit and fissure sealants. And even if you find a single carious, active carious lesion, that patient is a candidate for pit and fissure sealants. Because that's how we can avoid uh, future caries in such patients. And then we have this silver diamine fluoride. Although this silver diamine fluoride is uh, basically indicated for uh, carious lesions, which are uh, dentinal caries, which is already there. And because of some reasons, you're not able to do a restorative dentistry, like the child is very, very uncooperative. And sometimes uh, you need some time to plan. So in such cases, you can apply SDF. Many countries in the world were using SDF since long. Uh, but in America, 2014, uh, FDA uh, gave recommendations. And since then, it is used in USA. But many of the countries in the world were still using SDF since many, many years. Uh, it contains silver, ammonia, and fluoride. These are the basic components. And it will arrest dental caries. It will prevent dental caries. And obviously, it decreases dentinal sensitivity because it occludes open dentinal tubules. And the patients who have uh, special healthcare needs and the, you want to delay the treatment, the patients are not very cooperative. In such patients, you can do the treatment with SDF. It's not uh, because uh, if you see at the literature, the caries rest will be 96%, prevention will be 70%. 70%. These are the studies which have been there. And uh, uh, there are more studies. You can easily Google and you can go with the PubMed or any of the site which you have. And you can see a lot of literature about the success stories of SDF. And uh, technique is very simple. Uh, this material is uh, applied onto the any incipient carious lesion or even the cavitated lesions. Uh, the field has to be dry. The surrounding tissue has to be protected with petrolatum jelly. And it has to be rubbed into the cavity for one minute. And then it has to be washed. And the other thing is, uh, we can apply a fluoride varnish over, uh, this, the, over this um, silver diamine fluoride application because that will mask the taste of silver diamine fluoride. Because sometimes the kids don't like the taste even when they rinse. So after you finish your application for one minute, you can apply uh, sil uh, this uh, fluoride varnish, which will actually mask the taste. And consent is very, very important. Written consent is very, very important because this makes the teeth black. That is the problem. So the written consent is very, very important because the patient should know, the parents of the child should know there are other treatment options available also. But why this has been done, they should know and they should give a consent to it. They should agree to it. That is important. And this can be done twice in a year. Uh, that is what the studies say. Twice in a year, you have to apply it. And uh, even more, you can apply it because there is no limit on the number of applications. Uh, uh, you can do multiple times. It is not a problem. And uh, then the cost, uh, it's variable because uh, uh, in different, different countries, it's a different cost. In India, it is roughly 2000 rupees for 5 ml of SDF. And with one drop, you can uh, manage to do uh, minimum five to six teeth. That's how we can do. And uh, suppose uh, this solution is touched onto the soft tissue, maybe the gingiva or maybe the surrounding area, there will be a formation of uh, uh, ulceration. And uh, this ulceration definitely will go with time. Uh, but the, it can cause a mucosal lesion, uh, discomatic, there will be a discomation uh, uh, onto the soft tissue. That's it can cause. 
uh, apart from that, if the patient is allergic to any of the component, then it cannot be used. If the patient has aesthetic concern, then you cannot use this because it will make the teeth black. So wherever it will touch, it will make everything black. That is the problem. And uh, there are guidelines uh, by American Academy of uh, Dentistry. You can just read those guidelines and you can know more about application of STF, especially in pediatric dentistry. So that is uh, uh, that uh, SDF arrests more than 90% of the caries when used twice in a year. And it has a powerful indirect prevention and uh, dry the tooth before use, it's a very important. And SDF stains everything black wherever it will touch. So you take care of that. Now in, 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 in nutshell, for the primary teeth, if there is a caries, occlusal, approximal, or facial. We will talk about only non-cavitated, non-cavitated, and non-cavitated. So for that, sodium fluoride varnish, 5% with sealant, or only sealant if it is on the occlusal surface. You can apply 1.3% APF also, and then 0.2% sodium fluoride mouthwash, mouth rinse every week, but take care, not recommended for very young children. For a proximal surface, same. For the facial surface, 1.3% APF gel and 5% sodium fluoride. That's what is recommended for occlusal, proximal, and the facial surfaces. For the permanent teeth, same, same protocol is recommended, but for the root surface, for the root surface, non-cavitated or cavitated, 5,000 parts per mineral fluoride, that means 1.1% sodium fluoride toothpaste or gel is recommended. That is for adults. So if this is not feasible, if it is not possible, then go ahead with 5% sodium fluoride varnish or 38% silver, silver diamine fluoride plus potassium iodide because it will stain less. Uh, it, or if it is not available, then you go ahead with 38% silver diamine fluoride. 1% chlorhexidine is recommended because the studies say that 0.12% or 0.2% mouthwash, chlorhexidine mouthwash does not have any significant result. But if you apply 1% chlorhexidine varnish plus 1% thymol varnish, that is the combination, 1% chlorhexidine plus 1% thymol. If you apply that varnish, that has antimicrobial property. Those are the studies. And then, depending upon the target, if we divide your therapeutic strategies, for the biofilm, we need to maintain oral hygiene, antimicrobials, like we just discussed, then probiotics. For the diet, for the nutrition, you need to go ahead with the diet substitution, oh, sorry, diet modification and sugar substitutions with alternative sugar. For the recalcification, provide the substances which promote mineralization. And those are fluoride and calcium. And even from the saliva, calcium and uh, fluoride could be available if you stimulate saliva by giving xylitol tumors. For diffusion into, uh, into uh, incipient carious lesion, we have two ways. One is pit and fissure sealants, both resin based and glass inovated based. And then we have a resin infiltrate. And that is a micro invasive method of treatment of incipient carious lesions. And about the sign and symptoms, like a cavitation, you need to go ahead with the restoration. But that was not a part of this webinar. But if you need to go ahead with restoration, it has to be done with minimal invasion. So uh, 
for correct or the excellent treatment for the management of caries you need to go ahead with early and correct diagnosis that is important if you catch the disease early you will be able to reward the decalcification of the enamel or the dentin and correct diagnosis is very very important to know about the risk of a uh, risk assessment of that particular patient you need to know about the main etiological factor which has caused caries that is important there are many many uh, techniques available technologies available you need to uh, identify monitor the biofilm you need to check the diet analysis you need to modify the diet you need to go ahead with the topical fluids and maybe antimicrobial agents in selective cases there are references i could not post all references almost all those references are there from which i have prepared and uh, this is my email id v i r i n d e r g at the rate gmail.com my phone number is there 9854666666 i'm there on facebook i have two accounts on facebook virendra goel and virendra goel 2 and if you have any query you can join me you can uh, post your query through email maybe or uh, we will get some comments uh, i don't know how many comments are there mm, let me check because i could find so we got some queries yes let me off the screen first okay I'll stop sharing it. Yes, Jasmine. Uh, one is presentation. First of Thank all. You. Yes, sir. So, what will be the best material for indirect pulp capping with the light cure composite or yes. GIC? Yes. This okay. is the question asked by uh, Dr. Suraj. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Suraj. Although actually this was not the topic today, by chance. we did not talk about the cavitated lesions uh, but definitely uh, would love to answer that actually see for any cavitated caries lesion as i have mentioned somewhere that we need to treat the patient conservatively with minimal invasion now whenever you find any caries lesion previously we used to remove all affected infected everything and we want that our dentin should be neat and clean yellow shiny and then we need to uh, fill the cavity but not now we just need to remove caries from the walls of the cavity not from the floor of the cavity because even if the dentin is infected it is full of bacteria but once you make a peripheral seal the bacteria are not going to get food from anywhere from the oral cavity and ultimately no one can survive without food right so even if you leave behind a good amount of caries at the base and seal the lesion sorry seal the lesion with good uh, resin material by using excellent bonding techniques you will seal off all those lesions uh, all those bacteria and those bacteria are going to die even not die may not be active they will remain dormant will not cause any harm and ultimately the dentin will become hard and rested <coughs> this is how we can treat those cavities and no doubt we need to give a liner so that it can respond to Uh, it can make a secondary dentin or tertiary dentin that's important we need to give a liner and preferably a light cure uh, calcium hydroxide over that uh, glass enamel and over that we give uh, composite depending upon the depth if the depth is not more you don't need to give a glass enamel in between you can directly go ahead with composite but if the depth is more the area is wide then you need to go ahead with 
uh, sandwich technique or lamination or stratification, whatever you name it. Then, uh, next Dr. question is by Dr. Suraj. Yes, can we use glycerin instead of Vaseline or water-based jelly? Glycerin is of no use, but you need to use a Vaseline or a petrolatum jelly because that's a very, very easily available and you can anytime protect the surrounding surface uh, with this. Uh, SDF mouthwash is not at all available. SDF mouthwash, because SDF is available as 38% SDF, silver diamine fluoride. So that is not available as a mouthwash because it has a very, very bad, bad taste. It is not at all likable uh, by the kids. So it has a very bad taste. So mouthwash is not available. It is only a professionally applied solution available in 5 ml or 8 ml bottle. And uh, now in India, many companies are manufacturing it. Uh, previously, it used to be imported only, but now uh, many companies are making in India. Also. Next question is by Dr. Pavan. Uh, yeah. She what asked, alternative, what alternative uh, would you suggest for cavitatal lesion in permanent teeth without use of hand piece? Yes, we have uh, uh, chemo mechanical removal systems now. And uh, maybe your question may be because of uh, aerosol and all that, right? Because for permanent teeth, uh, we have only option is ART or a chemomechanical removal system. Atraumatic restorative technique <coughs> and chemomechanical removal system, that is the only option available. But if you want to avoid excess cutting, then we have polymer burrs because polymer burrs will only remove carious dentine and polymers burrs cannot remove healthy enamel. So that is another option. Then, uh, no, uh, Dr. Janani, no, we cannot, uh, uh, her question I will repeat, say, uh, can we use bonding agent before applying SDF to reduce discoloration? No, not at all. The dentine has to be available for action. If you cover dentine with something, then SDF will not act and SDF will not give its effect. But potassium iodide is one of the solution which you can apply after SDF application. This will reduce the amount of discoloration, but it will not 100% eliminate the amount of discoloration. Uh, SDF in uh, Dr. Triveni, SDF in kids versus SDF in adults, impact on side effects of staining teeth. See, only impact is discoloration is aesthetics. If the uh, patients are not worried about aesthetic, then it does not make difference whether you use it in a kid or use it in an adult. Because there may be a special cases, special children who are not manageable, even the adults who are not manageable, uh, who cannot get your uh, treatment by sitting on a dental chair, get the air rotors and all that. But if you are able to manage those kids, with, uh, those uh, patients with application of SDF, at least you can delay the treatment. You will make their active carious lesions into arrested carious lesions. Along with that, no doubt you need to uh, 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 take care of the oral hygiene, the diet and all that, which is sometimes difficult for the special uh, patients to take care because of their own problems. But still, uh, by applying SDF in such patients, you can delay the treatment or you can help those patients. But the only concern is aesthetic. If they are not worried about black teeth, then it is not a problem. Any other question? I don't think so. Uh, Jasmine, what do you say? What about your view for BRICS 1000? Someone could ask this. Let me check where it is. Where it is? Sir, I got this in my Zoom group chat. I got this question. What about your view for BRICS 1000? Wait. 
I can't get you. Your voice is breaking. Uh, sir. Can you type? Can you type it? Okay. Okay. Your voice is actually cracking. I don't know. Or uh, can they type it here? Maybe in the. Uh... Okay. Okay. I'm asking. Maybe you can type to me. Yes, sir. I'm uh, typing. What is your view about Bricks Thousand? We got it here in Zoom group chat. No, that is basically a software. What What do you want to know about uh, this this uh, this product? So someone uh, questioned about only view about Brick Brick Thousand. Uh, I think if he or she will be having doubt, she'll uh, post it again. Actually, this is not related to us. Okay, okay. And next question is by uh, so Dr. Suraj Dillo, and uh, he asked how we actually come to know the carious lesion is inactive in mesial and distal side because it's in hidden contact. And we are unable yes, yes. to. No, I have I have mentioned few things like a visible plaque index. This is one. Second is the interdental papillary inflammation. Right, that is another. Third is whenever you find a proximal lesion which is not at all treated, that is always activation. Because what happens if the lesion is not open from the occlusal side, there is a already a content. So that area is always uh, uh, having a biofilm over it. And if a biofilm is there, then definitely this lesion will remain active. And to know more, sometimes you need separators. Like we are not able to clinically look at the lesion, then you need separators. But the only problem with separator is it is a two appointment. Like whatever you could do today, it is not possible to complete it in same sitting. You have to recall the patient after four to five days again, because till that time, the, the contacts are open and you can actually clinically see the lesions. But even in some cases, what we have seen even if you use separator, it is not possible to open more than 0.8 to 1 mm. So that is another problem. So then we have these guidelines, like plaque is there, then the bleeding is there, and then uh, the patient's own uh, risk, and then we have an IUP X-ray. You take a uh, uh, bite wing X-ray, and you see uh, the status of the radial sensi how much extending it is like whether it is into the outer enamel or it is a complete enamel or it is into the dentine inner dentine outer dentine like where it is so if it is there then you always consider that lesion to be active and treat accordingly because you cannot uh, do the treatment like suppose what happens sometimes in a radio uh, this uh, radiograph we see a radio opacity which is a d1 which is into the dentin outer. And then we start thinking that we need to make a class two cavity. No, first of all, we need to treat any D till D1 lesion conservative. We should do remelization. We can use a sealant. We can use a resin infiltrate. Once this is done, and then you can put the patient to follow up along with the recommendations for flossing, uh, for uh, fluoride application and for uh, tooth brushing and the dietary modification. If you take care of all these and put the patient for follow up and you can take a future radiograph and then you can compare both the radiographs about the increase in radiolescence. And clinically also you can see how much uh, increase in uh, black uh, opacity, uh, black area is there or is there any more break in continuity of the enamel or something. This is how we can check. Okay. But otherwise bleeding of the interdental papilla and the plaque, this is a very good line, good uh, landmark for knowing whether the lesion is active or not. 
and if present we should consider lesion as active whether it is active or no doesn't matter but if a bleeding is there into the intradermal papilla and plaque is there then we should consider that lesion to be active okay yeah oh sir it was very informative session thank you for taking out the time to speak to us today on this very interesting topic thank you once again and so it was really a great session full of energy and hosting your session was wonderful thank you so much so sir so, so last yes. ask all like if any question is there either they can post me on my email id which i have already mentioned i can show you again uh, this is my email id and my phone number is there they can whatsapp me uh, they can email me they can message me on facebook or anywhere and okay. i would love to answer all their queries this is all right sir okay yeah and uh, sir at last do you like to say some words uh, pardon uh, excuse me sir at last do you like to say some words mm, thank you so much uh, jasmine and i thank rakesh for giving me this chance to speak to wonderful audience i love answering and love uh, uh, presenting this webinar and i look forward uh, or in future also and uh, thank you so much and uh, be all safe and stay home stay healthy enjoy your family and please take care all of you well and good night thank you so much sir so we'll be back with our next session in few minutes for more information regarding certificate registration speaker schedule visit the link given below till then stay tuned thank you Okay, I'm going to the meeting.